Hello, welcome to theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, your host here in Seattle, the AWS reInvent building with Matt Garman, the CEO of AWS for an exclusive interview for reInvent and all the activity happening. Matt, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE in your studio. Thanks in home, home game for you, way game for me. <laughs> Absolutely, happy to do it. Thank you for coming in and uh, chatting. So obviously uh, reInvent, the biggest conference you guys have, it's been I think our 14th year. We've seen the transformation um, and you as CEO now, we, we talked in August about kind of your vision. Uh, folks can look at that YouTube video, but we kind of teased out this Gen 2 kind of cloud play with uh, Gentech AI and all this generative AI and agents are coming. The, the game has changed, but it's still back down to the infrastructure. And so I want to get into that with you, but I also want to talk about your growth. You guys had great earnings and you had great performance. I think it's a 10 year high for the stock price. The growth is continuing to go and we're in this post ZERP era. And there's a real emphasis on profitability. You guys are doing well, us as well as your customers. What's your view on the current market right now? Yeah, we're seeing uh, a lot of people that are, are really leaning into the cloud, I would say. Um, as we talk to customers out there, they are increasingly interested in, in how they drive revenue growth, how they drive innovation, how they get their businesses growing. And a lot of customers are seeing that Gen AI is one of the things that's driving that. Um, and as you increasingly talk to customers about how they're really going to get value and how they're going to get enterprise value and drive their businesses forward, they realize that it, they've got to get those workloads into the cloud so they can have the agility to take advantage of all the latest technologies that are coming out. And that means getting their data to the cloud, that means getting their applications to the cloud so they can apply all these new models, whether they're agentic uh, workflows, all of these new benefits that they see coming down the road, they realize that that cloud piece is there. And so uh, we see that as a real tailwind to the business and something that customers are really excited about moving forward. And what's your focus for uh, reInvent this year? Because obviously every year there's a slew of announcements. It's always the, the classic stack. You got infrastructure, you got the kind of the, the data layer and the higher level services. And obviously the applications are changing radically. What's the focus? You know, some of what the focus is, is um, we're also going to get back to, to some of the basics on, on just how do we go and help customers innovate in all the different areas that they, they get to. And I think, um, look, we'll have a, a lot of announcements and things about AI uh, and generative AI, but we're also going to have a lot of really cool innovations and announcements around the core of our infrastructure and thinking about compute and storage and databases. Um, that is an area that we have been hard at work innovating on, and I think it's uh, it's one of those things that we don't want to forget. It's kind of the core of what we do, and I think it's, um, uh, it's something that our customers are hungry for as they look for continued innovation across that whole stack, not just in the shiny new objects, which we'll have a lot of announcements there. Yeah, I mean, we, oh, I think our last interview, we, we talked about inference as the killer app, and you said mm -hmm. you can't have good training, you have good training, you need inference to go with that. Yeah. Um, what are some of the performance gains we're seeing this year? Because again, the hype curve yeah. of generative AI has kind of been gone, now we're in the reality curve, where it's That's like, right. show me the proof, but there's still a lot of work to be done at the infrastructure layer, because everyone wants performance, and they don't want to pay out the nose for it. Yeah. They want to have good cost structures and visibility into the unit economics. What, right. What's the update there? You, look, I think that there's two things you think about as you think about inference, and this is really is how do people really integrate it in. I think when we saw early on when, when generative AI kind of hit the scene two years ago, everybody ran and they did a, a quick proof of concept, right? And they put a chatbot on their website and they were very excited about it and, and they got some early wins. Now though, I talked to customers and they, they, they have 100, 200 proof of concepts out there in the enterprise, and they're trying to figure out how they actually now figure out, as you point out, how do you get value from that? How do you actually like drive enterprise value, not just have this cool factory go test? And so the couple things that customers are looking at are one, what is the cost and how do I bring down the cost of running that inference? And two, how do I actually integrate it into my production environment? And those are, those are two real challenges, right? Which are, are not there when you do a proof of concept. And so on the cost side, uh, we're driving down a number of areas where we think about new models, we think about new efficiencies, we think about new infrastructure, whether that's new instance types, new networking, et cetera. And so we're pushing really hard to continue to lower the cost of inference. And if you've seen over the last year, the cost of inference has been coming down and down and down. And we think that there's still a long way to go there. And we think that um, hardware has a lot to do with that. Um, the system or the service that you run there, and we think that Bedrock is a, is a great place for people to go to get that absolute lowest cost as you think about new models and, uh, and new infrastructure. But it's also just as important is, is really how do you integrate it into that data, right? Because it is, customers really are hungry for how do you take those 100 proof of concepts, turn them into the three or four or five real production applications where they're going to drive real enterprise value that's going to drive revenue, lower costs, et cetera, and that means how do you have a framework that it gets tied into your data? How do you have a framework that 
thinks about security, thinks about yeah. permissioning in your enterprise and, and your organization, thinks about how do you have an actual usable ability to go um, launch and build agentic workflows? How do you think about that whole piece that you really think about a production? And that's that's where I think customers see that AWS is quite good gonna, at. So you're going to have some IaaS, some infrastructure announcements around performance and Casilicon, like always, pretty much going to be the same. Everybody's uh, going to need to yeah. tune in so, for reinvent. Okay, but, so yes, uh, that's a yes. But uh, you expecting. know, we're we're very excited about many of the announcements. We have. Okay, so check the box on that one. And needed, <laughs> by the way. Okay, so that's going to power kind of this next wave. I think we talked about it in our last interview. You got to do the. You know, got to pedal as fast as you can on the infrastructure. Get the get the the chips going and the speed, and that's going to enable uh, this next layer up in the in the stack we talked about the gen stack. So we're seeing growth in the past side. Our research has shown that your past business is growing significantly fast. Obviously, the infrastructure has been the bread and butter, core services. But as Gen AI hits, we're seeing a lot of activity being enabled in yeah. database uh, and other services around workflows, end to end. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I talked to Werner about the Lambda 10 year anniversary, and what came out of that conversation I want to ask you is Lam Lambda enabled serverless. And, and it was a, no, it was a blu no blueprint, it was just, mm -hmm. it was solving a problem from core services that I think WeTransfer had and some of your other customers. And that opened up and became a legendary and historic product. And what that enabled was just better everything. Mm -hmm. Is there a Gen AI version of that? Because Gen AI sim has a similar pattern. There's no real blueprint other than you mm -hmm. got to get the learnings. Yeah. And so this is a past layer. It involves database. It involves a lot of these services yeah. that were used to be run a certain way, but might run differently. What's your view on this? Yeah. And also because agents are going to come out of this. Yeah. Uh, look, I, almost for sure that uh, the entire way that you go build um, generative AI applications is going to change and be reinvented. And because we're so early in that space, I think we're all. Uh, kind of finding how to go build that, and, and our job is to make that easier for customers. If you, if you take a half a step back, you know, you talk about kind of the, the core building blocks that we have in compute and storage and databases. I actually have this view that, um, you know, customers ask about generative AI applications. I actually think they're just applications. And so I actually think inference is the next core building block. And it is, if you think about it that way, if you think about inference as part of every application that you go build, it's not just a separate generative AI application and then all my other applications. It's every, it's just an integral part, just like you would think about, it's not a database application and a non-database application, it's just a part of what you might use. And so if you think about it that way, then you got to think about how does it get integrated into the fabric of what you're doing? And, and you think about, that means you think about data workflows, you think about how these models might interact really well with S3 and, and EC2 and your database and, and how do they all kind of work together and that's the job that we're trying to make easier for customers so that we so that when you're thinking about you know startups out there or enterprises trying to solve a problem and they're going and building a new application it's just a tool that they can get really powerful and exciting capabilities deeply embedded into their application. So serverless came out of Lambda, that basically still mm -hmm. ran on servers, it really wasn't serverless, it felt like serverless. Is there a Gen AI version of that coming that you mm -hmm. see? Because if you look at what you guys are doing, and you can see as you look at Bedrock and, and SageMaker under the hood there, you're yep. looking at essentially stitching together the mosaic of services mm -hmm. that was used to be standalone or configured either manually or the old school way. Old school way, it's funny to say that's the yep. old cloud way, but the new cloud mm -hmm. that you guys have with Gen AI, that's interesting because this is what agents need. They need to have the agility. Yeah. What are you learning from customers that's going to feed into this new new direction? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple things that I would say is uh, one of a funny anecdote. It was uh, I remember when I was running EC2, uh, and and Charlie Bell was super excited about serverless, and he was telling all of his directs everybody has to move their server their their services to a serverless offering. And I was like, what about me? He's like, okay, not you. EC2, <laughs> EC2 is actually servers at the end of the day. Uh, but- um, It's got to run on something. <laughs> it does, you do need to have an actual uh, yeah. server at the end of the day. Um, but you fast forward and, and that serverless model is still something that I actually think is super important in in AI. And you think about Bedrock. Bedrock is serverless, right? You, you send it tokens, you get tokens back. And as you think about agentic workflows, again, Lambda is a key part of that. So you can have this bit of compute that helps the models know where they're going to go. So I, I do think that as we look at those new models and you think about that new programming paradigm, um, serverless, like people don't want to have to go run large clusters of models. They may they may use compu the uh, uh, like EC2 and instances mm -hmm. to do things like uh, pre-training and fine-tuning and other things like that. But once you really get to the application, you don't want to have to worry about scaling and managing that infrastructure. And so that vision that we had about serverless 10 years ago absolutely still applies to where we are today. And I think the 
the AI models are, are, are easily applicable to that. And, um, and we'll, we, we kind of take that same mentality that just because it's a new technology doesn't mean that customers all of a sudden want to manage infrastructure, yeah. right? They, they actually just want to be, get the capabilities and actually go think about the logic and the workflows and the, the I mean, outputs. the magic of Amazon was abstracting away the complexities and just the, it's right. the functionality doesn't go away. Talk about agents because Agentic is the hot wave. I won't say shiny new toy because there's legitimacy to what's going to happen. You're already seeing Q yeah. doing it for developers. You're seeing it at, in yeah. business. This is going to be the application feature, whether it's retrofit or net new applications. Yeah. What's your vision on how you guys are going to create those agents? How do customers have an architecture and platform that's going to be successful? Yeah, I think it's, uh, and, and why people are excited about it is, it's, it's not surprising. I mean, it's why we launched um, Agents as part of Bedrock uh, probably six months ago. And it's, um, the key thing you want to think about is the value that you get out of, of many of these AI capabilities. Number one, there's there's kind of consumption, right? Creating content, summarizing content. That That is super powerful. And it is a, a thing that I think we have seen people get really excited about and embed in a lot of different things. There is, the next step is, how do you get many of these models to actually start executing tasks and doing the next the next wave? And that is what agents are all about. At the end of the day, it's they, they need to take that next step, right? If you can summarize a bunch of data into a crisp enough thing that you can make a decision on, how do you then automate that step? And it really is just process flow automation. It's thinking about yeah. how do you have these things really go. And and the cool part, and, and I think where we're the part of the problem that we want to help customers solve too, is that that, that we're at the part where that's possible now. Yeah. The, the interesting thing though is, when you really start to get leverage is that you have thousands and thousands and thousands of agents doing things. And then, you know, that pretty soon gets super complicated and a thing that is really hard to manage and wrangle and figure out how you do. We want to make it possible for people to actually go do agents at scale, think about more complicated processes at scale. And what are the frameworks and areas that we can help them actually kind of drive that so that it's a, a manageable process? Because if you have, a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand agents out doing things like yeah. pretty soon that process gets unmanageable and so we're, we're trying to think about how do we help customers solve those problems. Well that's why I brought up the Lambda um, conversation yeah. because I think that enables serverless to do a lot of these things of distributed computing but you're bringing up a great point I think this is the hot topic that we want to dig into is multi-agent and distributed AI workloads because what, yeah. you're, what you're basically saying is it's not an agent it's this collection of agents it's multiple agents that's right. it's distributed AI with agents they have to talk to each other how do you handle resilience routing, yeah. these are technical but important things. Uh -huh. How do you roll back and recover That's right. from a security standpoint? How does resilience fit into agents? Because you know things are yeah. happening all the time. Yeah, and look, the industry is moving fast and, and we're trying to help people get their hands around it so that they can move fast with it. Anything that in reInvent you think is going to pop out that's notable, people should pay attention to around as they think about distributed computing going agentic. Mm -hmm. What are the key things that you guys advise and hear from customers that it's, that's on their mind around setting the table for this future? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I think, honestly, um, there are so many innovations in, in this space. Much of what I think customers need to do is take a half a step back and really push themselves to think about what's possible. It, it actually is, is it's surprisingly, it is actually this, the, the, one of the things that causes people to go the slowest is not realizing how they can think about using these technologies and, and how, and so as, um, uh, as customers come to reInvent and, and there's gonna be a ton of opportunities for folks in reInvent to get their hands dirty and actually start playing with these technologies and thinking about them, but come kind of thinking about your business and thinking about the processes and thinking about how could you do things differently? Because that is the key that we're really trying to unlock here. It's not about you know, making 5% improvements in what you're doing. It really is about making really stepwise changes in the capabilities that, that whole industries are able to accomplish. And that's, that's what really what we're targeting. Compute and data go hand in hand together. You mentioned Inference is the killer app. We, that's key, Agentix here. What's the customer uh, outlook look like when they when you guys get feedback and you have that feedback loop from customers with with these end to end workloads? Because you know it's, in the enterprise it's end to end and compute's needed. There's, you don't want to have a centralized. It's distributed computing. What's the customer feedback loops look like when they start to come to AWS? And what are you seeing? And, yeah. And from a database standpoint, from a services standpoint. Yeah. Uh, look. Our customers give us a wide range. We have a lot of customers. We get a lot of features. So there's not a, a homogenous customer out there. But um, you know, I think there's a couple things that if I was to distill a lot of that feedback that we get, um, number one, uh, they want help. It's there's a ton of technology that's flying at them. There's a ton of potential they seem for the business, and and they need our help to to figure out how that they corral that. 
And they also tell us, and, and you'd be maybe surprised at this, but they, they also tell us, like, don't, don't forget about the fundamentals of the things that I need to do. And, it, and they're like, it turns out the vast majority of my workloads are still on premise, and I actually need help migrating and modernizing those just just to get to those to the cloud. And how can you make that go faster? And that actually will will del uh, deliver huge amounts of value to my business, so I can take advantage of these new capabilities. And so, sometimes we get really spun up about you know go do agentic workflows or whatever, and and the customers are like, but my data is in a yeah. mainframe yeah. in my data center. Like I can't go do an agentic workflow on my my mainframe. That doesn't work. And so we also can't forget some of those fundamentals. Like we've got to get. Yeah. That mainframe move to the well, cloud. Well, that brings up legacy modernization is a big yeah. trend we're seeing. You got all kinds of existing stuff. You don't need to throw it away. You can put, I won't right. say a wrapper around it, but conceptually you can That's integrate right. it in with Gen AI. What's your vision on that? Yeah, I, I think you like the the key piece is getting it to an environment that you can look at it, catalog it, tag it, and then and use all of that data in a in a more modern framework. And and increasingly, and actually AI helps a lot with this, is that we're making it easier and easier for customers to to get their data into the cloud, to, to, to get it into a usable format where they can go access it really quickly. And, um, and I do think that that is a, a thing that customers want a lot of help on. And then you can get it into a containerized format where you don't have to completely rewrite things. You can get a lot of benefits there pretty quickly. But yeah. You know, last time we talked, the you know, enthusiasm's high, obviously, with, with Gen AI and Amazon's uh, mm -hmm. position in the cloud right now. Um, but the confidence sometimes when costs are thrown around. Resource planning is a huge conversation. Mm -hmm. I know we've had it in the past, and I think in reInvent, what's top of mind is, how do I plan and cost out? Because yeah. you can you can really make a <laughs> an error by getting all this training done. It's like, where, where's the beef? Like, mm -hmm. where's the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, mm -hmm. Because if the cost overruns happen, you see a lot of people kind of look at the cost and say, yeah. well, I got to manage costs. I love doing all this work, yeah. but when we put it in production, it's got to work, check, but mm -hmm. what's the cost look like? How do you view that and what are customers saying? Yeah, I, I think even as much as important as the costs are, and they're super important, and we give customers cost guardrails, and we're trying to think about more ways that we help them understand what the costs are going to look like. I, I think more important, though, is actually thinking about what is the value that you're going to get from going and doing this work. I think a lot of times what we saw is people rushed into launching cool, what seemed like a cool AI application, and they didn't actually know what the benefit was going to, like, it, it kind of like, the whole kind of ROI analysis or thinking about the benefit to your business kind of went out the window in the in the rush of, of going and getting something out there so you could tell your board you had a Gen AI application, and um, and now I think this is critical, right? If you can if you can kind of it, it's the same as it as it was before. As you look and you want to say what is the value I'm delivering to my business? Where do I think the the gains I'm going to get either from reducing my costs somewhere in the organization? ramping revenue faster, delivering value to my customers, whatever that ROI is, and then you can go look at that cost and figure out if you think that that's worth it or not. But until you have that second part of the equation, the costs are, they're, they're always going to be too high if there's no value coming out the end, because yeah. any any dollar you spend is, is not but worth it. But you feel good that you have the cost controls for customers to manage and have visibility. We do, that... and, and it's, you know, customers have to pay attention to it and they have to think about it, yeah. but, uh, but we have lots of, of capabilities for customers to have guardrails around those. And, and frankly, we are trying to, spend a ton of time lowering the unit costs so that every little bit of work that they do um, costs less and less every What's your every advice day? to partners as they navigate through the ecosystem as it evolves? Because what's, you're seeing a lot more connected oriented. It's not just APIs connecting, you have Gen AI data layers connecting into the system. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your message to partners as they try to navigate? Because you know, look at you guys are growing fast and it's getting bigger and bigger and you know, it's providing more value with the cloud. So they need to navigate and be in the good position to monetize their business and get distribution with yeah. this distributed computing model. You know, I think, um, you know, one, one thing I would say is there is more opportunity for partners than there has ever been. And, and you know this as well as anybody. Partners has always been a, a very central part of what we dis of how we go to market, of how we support our customers. And we're very aware that we can't do everything, that we're not going to be the experts, and that and many of our partners are the are the deep experts in the customers, and they know deeply their business, and they know how those workflows operate. And particularly as you think about, look, as we're talking about, you know, how do you uh, go and, and, and actually implement an agentic workflow, um, you've got to pretty deeply know, like, what are the business processes and how do things work and where are the right sets of data and where is the value? And our partners are key to that, whether it's ISV partners or uh, systems integrator partners. There, there are many customers need help. And they're, they're going to need help to make it easier. They're going to need help to move faster. People aren't going to be able to build all of these things themselves. And so I think the opportunity for partners is is massive and it's much bigger than it's ever been. And, and we're not going to get, frankly, as a business for AWS um, and all of our customers, we're all not going to get to where we 
need to be if we can't bring that have that partner ecosystem help us. The get cloud's there. the gift that keeps on giving for partners. Let's talk about developers. I know you got to run, but I want to get into the, the uh, entrepreneur developer angle. Yeah. You know, in Silicon Valley in New York, where we're doing a lot of interviewing with founders, you know, this, not publicly talked about, but in the hallways we're hearing, I can't get GPUs. Um, they don't have a lot of cash either, so they're innovating. <laughs> so um, and that's you know yep. kind of over the top, you know, hyperbole, but that's generally the sentiment. They yep. want more value. They're they're coding. It's it's mm -hmm. the same vibe that was in the early days of AWS. What's your yep. what's your value proposition to those folks that are innovating that need resource? Yeah, oh, look, we're we're driving as fast as possible to get capacity, and and we, there's a well known there's been a capacity crunch across the industry for for the last. Two years probably, and uh, and it's you know it still exists today, and we are we 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 are adding capacity as fast as humanly possible. We're adding power as fast as possible, um, and we're thinking about how we how we offer lower offerings and um, uh, lower priced offerings. I think both of those are important. I think driving down the costs for for startups and and enterprises alike. Everyone cares about costs, but I think startups, as you know, are are, are near and dear to my heart, um, and and I hear that feedback as well. And so we're both thinking about a lot about how do we um, make sure that we just have more capacity for everyone, but also how do we have lower cost options so that people have options out there. You guys are leading in CapEx. I mean, do you sit down and talk to Andy about, hey, did we get a nuclear reactor? Let's spend some more CapEx. How does that conversation go? What happens there? I, I, on the CapEx side, you guys just are leaders in spending. You got the nuclear option now. Is there more coming? Um, look, we, we think about, um, look, we're, our, Ours is a capital intensive <laughs> business, and, uh, and it turns out as you're growing as fast as we are, it means you need to add data centers, you need to add servers, and so that, that is the business that we're in. I think we've built a pretty good um, uh, capability of really understanding how do we responsibly spend at the right time, push the spend out, so that we have enough capacity for our customers uh, whenever they need it, but also that we're not being irresponsible from a, a corporate governance point of view. And so, um, yes, spend a ton of time thinking about that, and um, and we're very intentional about how we go spend. But um, and nuclear but, is on the table. Um, yeah. that, and then nuclear, I think, is look. We're very also focused on on carbon zero energy, um, and I think we're we we spend a ton on. Um, adding new carbon-free energy to the grid out there. I think nuclear is a fantastic additional um, option to that portfolio. So Final question, now you got to go. What's the bumper sticker this year for reInvent? If you have to put it on the car, what's, what's it going to say? Oh, the bumper sticker. Do we have bumper stickers? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know that what's we have. What's the electronic billboard say? What's the, what's the takeaway? What's the tagline for uh, reInvent this year if you had to kind of put it into words? You know what? I uh, if you if you don't mind, I would probably still build. I'd steal from Werner. Like we we want people to go out there and build. Like it is. You know we Keep we building. build these. We build a lot of the technologies and we still develop the services that we have so that our our customers can go build and they can go invent. So thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks All for right. having me and thanks, thanks for coming out. Right. Yeah. It's the Cube coverage here at Reinvent's headquarters. This is a building called Reinvent here in Seattle. I'm John Furrier with the Cube. Thanks for watching.